Chao, abrazo, chao. Hey, I'm your host, Chadlack. This is the Cage Rage Podcast, where we're talking MMA, boxing history, and all things in between, the combat sports spot of the world. Uh, you're here today with my fight analyst, Miguel Iterati. Miguel, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you doing, Chad? Always glad to do a little boxing history with you, a subject near and dear to my heart here. Yeah, absolutely. Miguel is um, the archivist for the boxingchannel.com, the sweet science channel.com, and Miguel? The International Brotherhood of Prize Fighters. <laughs> Every time I say it, I get it wrong, so I just let him do it. Um, listen, we're going to dig deeply into some um, boxing history today. Um, Adolf was um, a lightweight that uh, wound up with um, pugilistic dementia. Uh, in fact, he was the first ever um, diagnosed with this, I believe. So we're going to let Miguel take it away. Um, I'm going to try and ask a few questions. I don't know much about this. I know an awful lot about um, brain injury and brain trauma through combat sports, um, but I don't know very much about the first guy ever diagnosed with pugilistic dementia. So I'm excited to hear about this as much as you are, and Miguel has a ton of information, so we're just going to let him talk. Uh, Miguel, where do you want to start out with this? Uh, take, take us through um, what happened. What's the deal? No. Well, I think, I, I think basically, you know, the tie-in to my, my modern times here is, and, you know, for MMA too, I think, you know, in MMA the time is coming where we're going to have to have some reckoning on, on things like, you know, head injuries and, yeah. uh, you know, how, how fighters are, are doing in their retirement and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, in boxing, because of their history, already has that. Now, I don't think that Adam Walgas was the first person uh, – diagnosed with dementia, uh, boxing dementia or, or, or pugilistic dementia, they knew about it. They called it punch drunkenness before him, you know what I mean? And and the old timers, even from his day, you know, talked about fighters and the suffering and things like that. So it's something that happened. Yeah. What separates Walgast is that his case became the one that appears in medical journals from that time. Okay, you know? so he, so wasn't, he wasn't the first one officially diagnosed. He's just the first right. one that you actually see in the medical journals. Right, and you start to see his name when you do a search on his name. You see, uh, you know, um, uh, the, all the boxing stuff. But then you start to get into page two and three of Google. You start getting into medical documents, you know, about his condition and things like that. Yeah, and I think that's important today because we don't have our arms wrapped around the, uh, you know, the head injuries thing. And uh, I, you know, I think it's something that the more light we can bring to it, uh, you know, the better. And I think Ed Walgas is a very good guy. Uh, for that, to not allow him to fade into memory and to, to keep him remembered in the public, uh, uh, you know, in the public eye. Uh, at the end of the day, with with a lightweight world champion at the time, you know, he was a guy that could say, hey, you know, I got 250000 bucks in the bank, you know, at the turn of the century and stuff. So these guys were the millionaires at this time. He was he liked the lifestyle, you know. I, I, I consider him a quirky individual. I know a lot about his his life. Okay, um, so you know, um, <laughs> let's 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 start with um, uh, first of all the audience um, and and me included. Um, take me back to what time period are we talking about? Uh, when was he born? He was born in February of eighteen eighty eight. Okay, right so he of, so he's he's on the nineteenth century oh, then. Um, yeah, there were two snowstorms there. I mean, one of them was a uh, snowstorm in, in March, and then another one in January, so they bookended his birth. He was born in, in northern Michigan, in uh, my, uh, where they used to do a lot of lumbering. Uh, in, in towns up there, uh, it was mainly 60-70% Scandinavian descent. Uh, so, you know, he's, he was a white boy from northern Michigan. Born in a snowstorm. Yeah. I mean, that snowstorm was, they, they sent kids home from school, and, you know, five, six days later, they'd find six or seven kids dead 
holding hands together where that guy got trapped in snow drifts and didn't make it home. Right. You know, it was a, an amazing snowstorm, amazing cold that year. And in, you know, in northern Michigan, it's, it's not like it was in Florida for it. In yeah. northern Michigan, a little ad wall gas was born. And, and there starts the story. Great, great. Okay, so wall gas is born in northern Michigan, um, which is brutal in and of itself. Um, I live in northern Indiana, so I'm not that far from it. And I know what, I know what a northern Indiana rough winter is like in a northern, and it makes a northern Michigan winter um pale in comparison so um tell me tell me then what happens he grows up kind of a a, a kid chopping wood he's a he's a he's a lumberjack of sorts and he gets into he gets his, into, farm, his, his family's a farm his, his family owns a farm okay so a farm. they're farmers our brothers and stuff. I, I found references that at some point in his teens he uh, uh was employed obviously delivering newspapers when he was younger and stuff like that a lot of the boxers Kind of learn boxing and things because you know they had a stake out their corner where they'd sell paper. You know, I mean, all that stuff happened. And Walgast did that. He also rolled cigars. Um, you know, there's that, something I found in one of the old newspapers, a, a reference he had made um, that his brother had gotten him a job rolling cigars when he was in his teens and stuff. Um, the, the 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 story is that they had gone to a resort on the lake uh, when he was a senior in high school. For like a, you know, basically a, a summer, uh, you know, day on the on the beach kind of thing, you know. Okay. Uh, it was a known resort at the time in the, uh, you know, early 1900s where, uh, you know, people vacationed there and, and things like that. I, I'm not, the names are going to escape me, but there, one of the entertainments was supposed to be a boxing match. And uh, one of the fighters didn't show up, and the word is that, you know, uh, Walgas, t uh, his classmates and stuff, talked him into doing the fight. At what age and, uh, would that have been? About 17, 18 years old. So kid. So he was probably already known as a little bit of a, of a tough guy. Uh, there's also the word that uh, a girl may have been involved, like he wanted to impress his girlfriend and things like that. And but uh, he did his first fight at a, at a you know public bazaar, and it was against a black athlete. That'll come into play because, as you know, unfortunately... Uh, you know, Walgast, when he won the lightweight championship, did draw the race line and said he wouldn't fight white, uh, black fighters. Um, but uh, he did fight one in his first fight, and in the earlier fights of his career, he did take on uh, black athletes as well. But And how, um, and how did he do in those fights? You know, he, he early on, I think what you're talking about here is you're talking about a guy who was an athlete, right? He was small at, a light, at lightweight, right? He's 5'4". So I think you're talking about a guy who starts off being a very athletic guy, a guy who's, you know, good at, at, at endurance and things like that. You know, you're talking about a guy who won the world championship in a 40, you know, the 45th round of a fight. Wow. You know, so, um, yeah, I think I think that plays into it. I think, you know, the, the idea of chopping wood and working on the farm and the farm boy stuff, that comes up. I think he really enjoyed being a tough guy, and I think that played against him. Descriptions of his uh, – defense are basically that he would give you the top of his head to hit you know which for brain trauma is probably not very good you yeah know? that's um <laughs> you know what i mean yeah but I, if he could get we can you, go into that later you, um so so okay so this guy um so so walgast um uh you you mentioned that um he, he started fighting because he had to he had to knock out his corner uh of the market on on newspapers so he starts fighting in the streets um, as a kid, and then he, so he kind of develops this tough guy character, and then they they go to an event and somebody doesn't show up, and he says, you know, I'll take the fight, and he fights a he fights a black guy, um, that's that's apparently older, and and does he win that fight then, or or do you know? Yeah, he wins the fight. He wins the fight. He goes on. He fights probably ten times in Michigan, and uh, you know, in what and, and, and is this is this still in his teens when he when he fights these yeah, ten times yeah. then? It, it, and you would have to turn this stuff local, local fare. You know what I mean? Okay. Michigan wasn't a hop. Northern Michigan wasn't yeah. uh, exactly a, a, a population hotbed either. Gotcha. It was at the end of rail, uh, some certain rail tracks and things that reached the area and things. And then they looped around, you know, where the resort was, came back to Detroit sure. and things. So the country was growing with newspapers and things. And this kid had access to newspapers, so they were reading about the fights and John L. Sullivan and, you know, was the history of it. By the time... Walgast was fighting in the mid and early 1900s. 
there were already a cast of boxing characters that were considered the old timers, like guys who you you know you the new guys weren't ever going to be as tough as those guys. And you know what we're talking about there? Can you not hear me? Unless I'm like yeah, yeah okay. just a little louder. Okay, so just to repeat, I'm going to give you a one, two, three. One, two, three. All right, by the time Walgast started boxing, which is in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the 20th century, 1900s, 1903, 04, right around there, you already had a cast of characters in boxing that were old timers. Like, you know, guys that were, you know, the new guys weren't going to be as tough as them, and, and those sort of things. You had John right. L. Sullivan was already well retired. You had the Joe Choinskis of the world. You had, you had already boxing royalty kind of thing. Yeah, and so what was what was constituted a tough guy, you know, was already being created. I think in Walgast's head, you know, Walgast then went to Milwaukee. Now Milwaukee was a real hotbed of, of boxing, and in Milwaukee, he figured out that he could hang and faced a lot of tough guys. Actually, the the thing about Milwaukee, if you look back at the history of boxing, they're going to tell you about the fights between Stanley Ketchell and uh, Billy Papke. Okay. These are, there were four fights these guys fought, and I mean it was the kind of fight where like in one of them, like uh, the the guy hit hit the other guy before the bell. In the second one, like the other guy responded and hit the guy before. They were all mayhem and they were all bloody and they were all like all time fights that people talk about. And at the time, they were impactful fights that you know people thought you know by by the time Jack Dempsey was champion, they were talking about these fights like they're never going to see that anymore. That was 20 years, you know, Dempsey in the 20s as champion. It was 20 years after those fights. There was some time there. Yeah, the Mickey Wall Ward guys, kind of fights. You know, yes, the kind that, you know, for, and for the time, you know, Mickey Ward cut back down to real rawness. Right. You know, not Marquise and Queensberry styled fighters, guys that came from somewhere else. And the stylings that we see now of advanced boxing hadn't been developed yet, you know. So I think I think you're talking about a real cast of guys. Now, one of the things about Walgast is when Walgast won the lightweight championship, 45 rounds, if I'm not mistaken, that was the last world championship of a 45 round fight. And and so, and and just to um to kind of help educate me and the audience again, what did a round consist of? Was that still a round these, ended when they, when someone dropped, rounds. or how did that work no, again? Since the Marquis of Queensbury rules were in effect, it's three minute rounds. So forty five okay. minutes, forty five rounds. You're talking about upwards of you know two hours of fighting. Good God! So, and then one minute uh, between, he, still correct? Yeah, he wins. He wins the fight in the forty fifth round against Battling Nelson, another guy. Battling Nelson, my favorite. I remember I, I was telling a story to one of the of, of, of boxing uh, guru that I know that doesn't know much about lightweights from the 1910s, and I was telling him a story about Bally Nelson. Bally Nelson was known for winning headbutting contests. Oh God! You know, talk I mean, about brain I, trauma. I, yeah, I think I, that's what I remember. The guy going, looking at me and saying, is, "Is that smart? Like, what does that say about somebody?" But it was a different time, and these guys. The idea of being manly, I think, you know, the much that that's what you're seeing there at its at its just where it's gone beyond. It's no longer really healthy. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's a little bit of what inspired some of these guys. And Walgast was known for taking a beating. The fight with Nelson. Nelson was known for taking a beating. Nelson beat Walgast to death for the first 25 rounds. Couldn't get rid of him, and then all of a sudden the little guy starts mounting a comeback. Walgast, a featherweight, moving up to lightweight. To take on the championship, wins the belt in front of thirty thousand. And he was outweighed by how much? No, the, the, the weights were even, but he was coming up, and Nelson, an established light world lightweight champion. Oh, you know? okay. Nelson, the guy that beat Joe Gans. Oh, okay. So, wow. And and just so just been, to just to just to um just to demonstrate how dangerous headbutting is. Um, used to in the in the NFL, you know. Somebody would get a touchdown. You'd, you'd see them kind of headbutt each other, just walk up and headbutt each other. That is completely illegal in the NFL now. None of that. You don't right. see that at all now. Completely illegal. So, right. okay, Here's proceed. The thing is, is to a certain extent, you know, we, we, we're we lucky that in society we have sport, you know. Absolutely. So in, in, terms of, in terms of combat, we don't really have life and death anymore, right? So yeah. now you take the life and death out of it, you know, where the toughest guy is going to eat, 
or, or not. And we're in a society now. So with the life and death out of it, at what point are we protecting them? The leaving it in the ring. How important is that? I mean, to the crowd and everybody loves it and stuff like that. But no one goes forward for the consequences. And even now, a century later, in football, in other places, we don't know anything. And that's why I want to bring Ed Walgas, you know, kind of back to life here, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so go ahead. So so Walgas, he... Um so he fights the 45 round fight and he wins his first championship. How old is he? Uh, he's in his early 20s. Okay, so he's a young he's guy. Like, yeah, 20, 21 years, early 20s. Um, he was born in 1888. Let me just double check when he wins the championship. I think he's 5'4 he's and, and he's, he's 125 pounds still at that point. 136, 135 was where the uh, lightweight limit was. Okay, but he was fighting up. Yeah, so he was 22 years old. He beat Valley Nelson in 1910. Wow, 45 rounds and he beat somebody at 22 years old. That's pretty amazing in and of itself. But but he took an ass beating for 25 rounds to, to do it, right? I mean, this is the kind of, it, it, let, let's get it straight. It was a four, packed it at 45 rounds. One of the last world title fights for 45 rounds. Joe Gans had fought 75 round fights. Walgast didn't get to fight 75 round fights. You know, Walgast is at 45, but Walgast was a throwback. For this 40 round fight. He won it in the 40th round. Put it this way the notes for the fight, even just on box track. Right? But just think of what it means. It, 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 Wall gets down in the 22nd round. <laughs> so he got trained. And then he gets up and kind of mounts a comeback by round 25. These were different kinds of fights. These were much more like MMA. You know what I mean? Man, I mean, so, you get, um, dro you get dropped in round 20. How much, be how much of a beating have you taken? What do you need? What what has to go through your head to get up and not stay down, right? What, what right there? There's a separation of many people. You know, there's not many guys who are going to get through that. It's completely so, different style that, of human being. You know, Walgas, and I think Walgas, in my estimation, I've done good studies on him. Uh, he starts to show the obsession, the obsession with uh, being treated like a world champion, the obsession with money, the obsession with equaling what Nelson had and getting paid and getting paid what Jack Johnson was making, the vaudeville tours. He tried it all, the videos and things like that. He tried it all, but it didn't work for him. He was one of the later generations. He never walked out with a million dollars for anything. Um, he did amass enough of a fortune. He sent money back to his family in Michigan. They bought farms. He married a sweetheart. I don't know the whole story behind his marriage, but there's an absolute story there, and it's got to be unearthed. All right. At some point from Milwaukee, he goes to California, the land of you know milk and honey kind sure. of thing. And again, now now a troop. Now he was uh, had the task of proving himself more than a Midwest fighter. And in California, he fought you know some real quality guys until he got himself into the title fight with battling Nelson, wins the world championship. And then from there, to me, already he's already starting to show signs of the obsession, the mental. Uh, the repetition, the, the the and 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 some discomforting signs that, that come to light. For example, um, as a world champion, it was hard for him uh, to get world title. You know, the world title fights actually signed. You know what I mean? Why? Uh, because negotiating, he wanted more money and things like that. He became a little bit hard to negotiate. I think that could be one of the signs. You know, an over expectation starts to become combative. He made some money. Married his sweetheart, sent money back home to Michigan where farmland was bought and, and more more territory and stuff like that. But very tellingly, he does on April of 1911, a year after he won the world title. Now I'm sorry, uh, February of 1911, a year after he won the world title, he fights a guy named Knockout Brown, and Knockout Brown almost beats him. Um, as a matter of fact, does beat him by decision kind of thing, but almost knocks him out. And Knockout Brown was one of those guys who's very descri interesting descriptions of him. They said he was cross-eyed and pigeon-toed, but the guy could fight. You know what I mean? So Nelson is world champion. The guy's both pumped up. Uh, I'm sorry, not Nelson. Uh, Walgas is world champion. The guy's pumped up to fight him, and they meet in a six-round fight. He's just getting a fight in and doing it in Philadelphia, a place that wants to see the lightweight champion stuff. Gets all he can, then goes back home to Michigan, Gets married to his sweetheart, and they hire a train 
on uh you know for their honeymoon kind of thing to take a luxury train was was the thing yeah and he goes back to rematch this guy in new york on his honeymoon the knockout brown yeah he goes back to rematch knockout brown now on his honeymoon curator, yeah the How curator romantic. the exactly and the curator of the museum in the home in Walgast's hometown uh of michigan uh, they have a, a county museum there that has, you know, I'm sure farm stuff and things like that. But it has a little section on wall gas and stuff. But it, and this is Cadillac, Michigan. He told me that wall gas never consummated the marriage with his wife. So they were on the train together, coming over. But he's got this rematch, and I don't know. I I'm, no I'm, sex before a fight. The whole that's thing. That's conjecture for me. But yeah, it, 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 the the guy told me he never. Um, never consummated the, the, the story with his wife, and they wound up in court. So at some point, he's in California. He's a star. He's been world champion. He'll lose the belt to Willie Rich, who, who became who's a, another. Well, first hold on, hold on. Did, does he? Does he? Does he? In the rematch with Knockout Brown at, in his honeymoon, does he win in New York? No, he lost also. Uh, ten round decision. So it's just so he decision. lost again. Yeah. So he wasn't looking good. Was coming off injuries and things, probably living the life, and and by living the life, I think, and never consummated his marriage, travel, but didn't consummate Damn. his marriage. I don't know that that meant he was a ladies' man. Maybe it does. I, I haven't seen proof that he was a ladies' man. I think he was more so singular, singularly obsessed and now brain damaged. With boxing, that became something that everything else was second, right? Yeah. So in California, at some point by 1917, his wife is suing for divorce. And this is what is really interesting. Uh, one of the boxing uh, sponsors out in California, one of the guys who paid for him to fight and that knew him and, and was sort of taking care of him as he deteriorated, bought uh, dozens of acres of property from him for like $200. Which even at the time was nothing because Walgas was selling it for that amount so that his wife wouldn't get it. Oh Again, he's God. already a mentally he's already a mental so she's suing him for this stuff and this guy actually um, bought it from him and gave it back to him. Oh, okay, okay. So it was a deal. But, okay. Yeah. Well. No, no, no. I don't think it was so much a deal. I think it was some, Walgas was selling this stuff. Trying to make the money. I don't know because I, I'm just seeing some newspaper accounts on oh, this okay. stuff. But delving into it. And, you know, so from here, I think the, the wife divorces. And in some of the papers, you'll probably find that uh, she's going to say he didn't consummate the marriage. I think that's where the, the curator at the museum would know about that. But I think you're starting to see the deterioration. Walgas escaped from an asylum in 1917 and lived it supposedly in the forest. By 1917, he's already institutionalized? Yeah, and still had three years of boxing career left. Holy so shit. Yeah. So he so he, he escapes the institution. Well, wait a minute. How did he get... Wait a minute. Back up. How did he get put into an institution? His wife sued him. His wife sued for divorce, <laughs> and he couldn't... And she sued to take over... Uh, Protecting, you know, his, uh, uh, what's it called, his uh, property and things like that, his estate. He couldn't handle his estate anymore. He's selling off property for a couple hundred bucks for whatever reason, and people are there. He gets put in an asylum. He escapes. He runs. He lives in the forest for three to six months, something crazy like that, until they finally corral him again. He starts to box again, boxes again through 1920. In 1919, He's looking bad, and he's a middleweight, and everybody knows he's shot. And he actually goes through an operation that, um, you know, it's funny because really life doesn't change. If you look back at the old newspapers and things, there's a lot of erectile dysfunction advertisement, you know, manliness advertisements, and, you know, goats are stout animals and things like that. So they had a charlatan doctor. The doctor's fortune actually has a museum and uh um, his house in Texas is, is protected that they can't, uh, you know, it's a protected landmark. Uh, and the guy built this house basically by taking people and cutting their scrotum open and inserting goat balls in there. And I'm not talking about implants what? where... Whoa. I'm not talking about implants where they're like, you know, attaching veins and things. I'm talking about the raw, cutting up of the scrotum, taking goat balls, tossing them in there, and sealing it up. You know what I mean? So this was what about to help your best. 
I, ne never, never mind anything else. What about the rot and infection? And supposedly the, the rot in, within that, and they, I guess there was some treatment stuff, but within that, the golf balls dissolve and go away. And the doctor had enough at this. I mean, I, I'm picturing the, the bottom line is the doctor had a farm, and you could go and you could go and look at the golf balls and pick the golf balls you wanted. You're like, hey, that's a good set. Those are the balls the I want in my set. Get the biggest set of balls, right? But so this actually happened. So that touches on steroids. Wow. It touches on it. And, and and what he was willing to go through to keep and extend his career, all the while wanting his world lightweight title back, right? And the obsession's there. So by 1920, even the golf balls haven't worked, and he's not boxing anymore. They give him work at gyms in California where he shadow boxes and stuff. And all the stories are there about. You know, people they, they give him, him wait a minute, minute, he got work where? In gyms. Oh, oh so he's working at a gym now. And so and he's, he, he's he, training kids and or he's no, pushing a broom. I think they had cleaning and they had him kept away from people. Man. You know, I think I think it was a dangerous conversation because it became it became a situation where you had a guy five foot four, a littler guy, right? That now really is not an impressive you know, whatever it was, you know, athlete that he was when he was young and vibrant. Yeah. It's a little impressive. And he's sitting there shadow boxing, kind of a joke. And, you know, you, you can see people, you know, but what if somebody said to him, shut up, man, you ain't boxing tomorrow. And then boom. You would get mad. You know? There's stories about him be fighting uh, interns in the hospital once hospitalized. Wow. Um, you know, because, because of just that, they would make fun of him and he would get mad. He could talk about boxing in the good old days and stuff. There were opponents used to go visit him when he was in the hospital afterwards and things. And he could talk about it, but there were certain things that set him off. Sure. You know? So, yeah, you're talking about a, a real dangerous thing. And, again, by 1927, they couldn't keep him out of the hospital. And he went into, into the hospital for the last time, and he died in 1955. So, sadly, you're talking about 27 years of his life spent in a mental institution where they basically managed him by telling him, they keep shadow boxing his boxing matches next week and things like that. Um, you know, those are the stories of Adam Walgas and how he faded, you know, into oblivion kind of thing. So it, it really becomes he a kinda, sad he, story. It's all, it's he he kind he kind of died of natural causes, or did he actually die of of? I mean, dementia doesn't necessarily kill you. Yeah, Everything around it does, but he died at sixty-seven. Um, he had gone blind, uh, yeah. and uh, he had been beat up by interns. At some point, there's a legal case where uh, a couple of interns beat him up God uh, at, at a hospital. That was only a few years before he died, so he was still physically capable of defending himself for you know a little bit. Yeah. He must have been a handful, you know. But there are a lot of stories like that, you know. Yeah. In, 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 but what makes what, what separates Walgas is Walgas was maybe the first guy, you know that. Once the newspaper era was there, he was the first of the big stars. And again, guys like Jack Dempsey would look at Adam Walgast and be like, "That's an old timer. That's one of those the guys I respect." You know, by the by the Dempsey era, by guys yeah. like that that didn't fight the forty five round fights, and they look back and they say, "That you know those guys were crazy. Those then, guys you, were you bad." Get that, you get that from generation to generation. There's almost like a tradition sure. in that. Where it's like you're never as bad as the guys that came before you, kind of thing. Yeah. Yet, you know, with the fans, you might be better than everyone, you know? But well, you know, them, that's. You know, that's you Miguel, that's interesting that you say that because we're starting to, you know, look, in, in, in MMA, which is another, obviously, this is the Cage Rage podcast. And so we cover boxing, we cover MMA, we cover all combat sports, we cover kickboxing, whatnot. Um, but we're, we're starting to see a real old generation of MMA now where, where we've got guys that, and, and look, we're seeing some of them who are fighting who should absolutely not be fighting anymore. And then we've got a real group of, of retired MMA athletes now. Uh, you know, the Dan Severins and some of those guys who are around Hoist Gracie, um, who, you know, let's hope they're actually done. Let's hope Vanderlei's done this time now. Um, you know, Ken Shamrock, I mean, the, the guy's got to be done. And, you know, we don't know, we, we don't know what the, what the undercurrent is yet on, 
on where they're at with CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, but we know that it's there. Um, we know that post-concussion syndrome is is an enormous part of this sport. Um, we we know that it's that it has a, a serious effect on a huge a huge um, portion of them, and um, I think I think we need to do a podcast on that really soon. And um, there's there's a big fight coming up that um, we're both really interested in. Um, tell me a little bit more about where you're wanting to take that and I think we're going to be doing a podcast on that really soon. Talk to me a little bit about that since we're talking about Adolf okay, here. Perfect. I mean, the reason to bring up Ad Walgas is basically exactly what you just said and that is to let, let's touch on the subject of brain injury and how it plays into what we have here. The idea of leaving it in the ring is something that the crowd asks for and stuff, but how much can you ask them to leave in the ring and then where does the responsibility come you know, when guys basically get forgotten, you know, there's stories about um, boxing guys from uh, Ad Walgas Sierra that, you know, that uh, I think it's Sam McVeigh died, got run over by a car in Ohio, just run over. And they were like, yeah, a boxing guy died and they buried him over there. And that's how they found his grave. You know, I mean, just frightening stories about when the guys, you know, you're talking about people that needed medical help that didn't get medical help. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and that opens up a real gamut of, of, of tragedies. And that's what, one of the things I think that makes boxing special, in a way tragic special, but in a way it makes it even more important to really document and remember the things is, is because these men are susceptible to tragedies on a level that is even different than some of the other sports. You know what I mean? Um, and part of that, you know, thankfully... You know, in football, too, I mean, you know, guys have died. Junior Seau has died. You know, Lyle Alzado died, uh, you know, under circumstances that were tragic. And I don't want to belittle any of that. But the goal of boxing is to damage the other guy in such a way, you know. So these guys carry – so I, I think Walgas is a guy that really deserves to be remembered, not forgotten. I think his story will hold up water, too, with all the other little nuances, even if he was quirky um, – you know, he was very much a character. Um, uh, there were times where, uh, you know, uh, he, the, he would hear rumors and he would write newspapers, the newspapers with, uh, you know, editorials of his own, you know, that he wrote and stuff. He wasn't a smart guy. Like, he wasn't like the greatest writing in the world. Part of what teed him off is that the, the media portrayed him as a little bit of a dumb guy. You know, he hated that. But, um, but yeah, he would respond in the media and stuff. So there's a lot there in just the newspapers about Ad Walgas. And I think, you know, um, some of the things he was like the Billy Papke fight with uh, Stanley Ketchell. I mentioned those all time great middleweight fights. I mean, he was at those. He, he was at the front row, you know, in Milwaukee as a kid, you know, being there. So, you know. If you could take a time capsule back, Ad Walgas watching that fight might have looked a lot like you watching Marcelo Garcia fight Ricardo Rodriguez, uh, Rico Rodriguez, right? Just Amazing. fucking excited out of your fucking mind. Like, holy yeah. shit, you know? That's what it must have been like, you know? So Walgas to me is one of those guys should be remembered, not forgotten. And uh, the tie-in to right now, what you're talking about is I think in MMA, this is coming. I think we're going to have some stories. I think Gary Goodridge is out there. It's a pretty uh, documented story. Not that yeah. anybody stepped up and made his life more comfortable, I don't think, you know. Maybe somebody's thrown him a little bit of money or help here and there. But there's not an infrastructure there that says, hey, Gary Goodridge is taking care for the rest of his life for, you know, what he did for, for the show. You know what I mean? There's not there. There are other docu uh, incidents. But is is that going. true? Because I haven't heard that about I haven't heard that about Gary being taken care of that way. No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I haven't seen that happen. You know? Yeah, I, I haven't that seen that happened. either, and that should be the case. I mean, and, and, he was the guy who stepped in over and over public. again. Goodrich you know? is a guy who's in there, uh, you know, in the public with his with his with the damage done. There are other MMA guys who are already suffering that are not receiving any media attention, and that may be deliberate, but it may be not. Maybe they're just fading into, you know, the past, and people yeah. forget but there are very clear examples of UFC fighters that, yes. you know, that got to question what's going on out there. And which um, brings me to the coming fight between uh, Brian Ortega and Max Holloway. On paper, talent-wise, this is the hottest fight, you know, 
for me in a long time. Fantastic you know, fight. excited about it. You know, Holloway really is a, a guy that, you know, has come through so much to win the world championship and stuff. But what That's has amazing. He come, because he's had fights canceled because of brain, uh, you know, scans or uh, a, a more, more correctly, he had a fight canceled because of showing symptoms of being uh, concussed at the weigh-ins. So I, either he got knocked out in training or something, but there's something there. And Holloway's one of those guys who may be elite now, and hopefully he's back in enough money he never has to worry about it. But maybe in the future, uh, you know, he's going to wonder should he have been rolling back out there. So, yeah. you know, it's still very relevant today. And um, that's why I wanted the wall gas uh, re remembrance for this one. Uh, anything you want to add to this one before we go? No, like I said, I mean, uh, Adam Walgas deserves to be remembered. Uh, he definitely left, uh, you know, the better part of his livelihood and life in the ring for uh, as a performer for us. And hopefully his legacy is that people don't forget uh, that these guys are really risking their brain and their health when they go in the ring. Uh, you know, it would be great if people remembered that for that, for him. And I think that that would do him justice. Here's the Addy Walgas. Cheers. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you for Hey, don't forget, uh, subscribe, hit the button below, uh, comment to us, Chadillac at the Cage Rage Podcast.com, Miguel Adorati at the Cage Rage Podcast.com. Send us your comments. Let us know what's going on. Tell us how we can help. Tell us what we can do to improve. We love you all. Thanks for all your support.